Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest video in our Q&A series on IR careers called Off the Record with Smooch. Uh, joining me once again is Smooch Reprovich Rosenberg, um, the highly experienced executive search consultant. Uh, great to see you again, Smooch. How are you doing? Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me. I'm doing terrific. Thanks. How about you? Very good. Thanks. Just uh, dealing with the heat wave in London, trying to stay cool. But um, apart from that, doing very well. Um, good. And in case anyone hasn't seen uh, these videos before, I'll give you a quick recap. So uh, Smooch loves answering questions off the cuff um, at IR conferences, you know, at the end of the day when people are just throwing out different questions and whatever is on their mind. So we're recreating that experience here in these videos. I have a list of questions. Smooch hasn't seen it. Um, and I'll be putting those questions to Smooch and asking her for her thoughts. Uh, so Smooch, are you ready to go? Got my catcher's mitt out. Fantastic. So the first question relates a bit to something we were talking about in our last video, um, which is someone has asked, you know, I changed jobs recently over the last couple of years and in my new role, I'm just not happy. Uh, it's not what I expected it to be. Uh, what should I do now? Um, so what advice would you have for that person? You know, Tim, I get this a lot and I have to tell you, it's really, it's very frustrating. People should be savvier in their interviewing. And um, I think a lot of professionals, when they become unhappy, they point the finger at their boss. But let me tell you something. When you're in that interview phase, there should be, you go through round one, you get acquainted with the CFO and a few other executives. You go on to round two, maybe you meet the CEO, a few other executives. If the CFO has not asked for a second meeting with you, you absolutely should ask for it. And why is that? You know, it's an opportunity. After you've met an executive once, you go to that second meeting and you're more comfortable. You know each other a little bit and the formalities soften up. So you can really start to do what I call is setting the table. And by that, I mean, you can start asking those really specific questions about expectations, uh, working style, the cadence of communication, um, what that CFO expects of you, what the board expects of you. So you can really drill down on as closely as you can to minimize risk of not liking the job once you take it. Nothing is perfect. You're never going to have 100%. In fact, I tell clients that my job is really about managing risk, and I can only manage it to the lowest number. I can't eliminate it. And I think candidates need to get comfortable with um, helping themselves to manage risk. There's this phenomenon that happens of, you know, it's kind of intoxicating. You've got a, a recruiter calling you, a company's courting you. It's something new and fresh and exciting. You've got this silver object over here that you're, you're racing towards. And people lose their objectivity. What's the worst case that can happen if in that second round with a CFO, you ask too many questions or you want too many specifics and the CFO decides, you know, this isn't the right fit for me. You have nothing to lose. You're gamefully employed, hopefully. And if you're not, you still don't wanna take a job that's not right for you. Um, so I think people need to get comfortable with, put your emotions to the side and go about your interviews as though it's actually an M&A process. Because as an IRO, you wouldn't infuse your emotions in the M&A process, even if you thought that company was a great possible acquisition. You're going to give your bosses your objective, savvy um, uh, viewpoint that comes from a place of experience. So that's, that's what I would do in a situation like that is interview thoroughly yourself because it goes both ways. Thank you, Smooch. No, that's great advice. I love that idea of bringing a uh, m and mindset to the process, as you say. You can't, re you can't eliminate all risk, but the due diligence is absolutely vital. Um, so then this sort of brings me on to my, my next question, which we, we fielded a couple of times at our events, um, which is, how do you know when it's the right time to move jobs? For example, if you would like more responsibility or if you would like, you know, to... to uh, in, increase your compensation you know so for IROs who are in that situation where they're not sure whether to sort of stick or twist in terms of their current role uh, what advice would you have there 
Well, I think it really, if you distill it down to what are the drivers and motivations for change, first of all, if you're in good standing with the company you're at and you want to either acquire a set of very different responsibilities like strategy, for example, or M&A or corporate development, you or even leave behind your IR responsibilities and go into wholly something different like M&A, I think you're safer doing it with the management team that you've already built a credible brand with and reputation than trying to leave a head of IR role and go to a brand new company to be head of strategy. You know, get, get that experience under your belt with a management team that believes in you, and then you can leave the company to go do pursue M&A or strategy or whatever it is that's outside the IRO field. Yeah. Um, I think if your motivation is purely more money, that's not good enough. And I have to tell you, we are very, very particular about what are the drivers for a candidate wanting to make a change. And so, again, it's another opportunity for an executive to stand back, gain some objectivity and think clearly about why do I want to make a change? Am I really unhappy in this operating environment or do I just think I'm underpaid? If you think you're underpaid, do the research and create a compelling business case for your boss as to why you're not paid, what you should be, what market is. Um, so, again, I think that people need to think about what are the drivers of motivation. Um, and that will both for a recruiter as well as um, a company directly or even their own management team be a stronger strategic thought process of what's motivating them uh, than just simply, well, I, I want to go make more money or I'm tired of this industry. Because if you say you're tired of an industry, for example, and you call someone like me and say that, I'm going to say, okay, well, in five years, you're going to be tired of the next industry. I mean, you have to put on that executive hat as though you're in the boardroom or in the C-suite. And how would you make a concrete, smart, savvy decision? How would you advise your CEO about making a decision? Same concepts apply to individuals who are navigating their careers. Does that make sense? Yes, Mooch, absolutely. I think that's a great sort of um, framework for how to think about that uh, decision. And, you know, as you say, to, to how those kind of conversations might be received by the, you know, the company that you're working for and also recruiters that you might be talking to as well. Um, next question is on a very sort of, you know, hot topic, although it's, it's been a hot topic for a very long time now, which is ESG. Um, so the question is, what kind of ESG questions or ESG related questions are being asked in IR job interviews at the moment? Well, that's a big question, uh, Tim, because it's all over the map. Some companies have only put their, their big toe into the ESG dialogue. Others have ESG committees already formed. So it varies from company to company. And I think the best uh, thing that an IR professional can do if they don't have a lot of tangible experience in it, but the company that they're going to interview with um, has a burgeoning or evolving uh, focus on that is study. You know, you everything, knowledge is at our fingertips with the internet, right? So know the vernacular, take a look at companies in uh, the peer group of the organization that you're going to go interview with, take a look at the, the five best competitors and see what they're doing. So you can have an intelligent conversation with anyone you interview with so that they know that you've looked at their peer set and you understand what the other companies are doing and can make at least a somewhat intelligent comment about where you think you might want to take the company that you're interviewing with. It's still such a new topic for a lot of organizations, but that's what I would do. Mm, absolutely. And as you were saying um, previously, you know, doing that, that research, doing that study ahead of, you know, the, the job interview, um, you know, deep dive into the company, the industry and so on is, is so important, regardless of what the, what the specific question will be. Um, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right, Tim, because, you know, a lot of people are afraid in an interview situation to share their viewpoint. You're being hired to have a viewpoint. You're not being hired to be a yes person once you're in that job. And so the more you can develop your confidence about, and confidence comes from having knowledge, 
plus your own career experience. Because when a CFO asks you, what do you think about that last earnings call and how did the CEO and CFO, uh, you know, how did I do? If you haven't watched it, you're going to be out. You're going to be eliminated in a heartbeat because you haven't invested in the opportunity. If you don't have a viewpoint, they're going to say that they're never going to, you're not going to be that subject matter expert that they want to hire. So you have to take a little bit of a risk. And if you thought that, you know, most of what the CFO said was right, but he could have done or she could have done a better job positioning the company and shifting the narrative, you have to say that and you have to give the reasons why, uh, because that's part of what they are looking for. I think also the pandemic has amplified that viewpoint on the part of management teams that they want their IRO to have, to come to the opportunity with experience, to have a viewpoint and be able to intellectually debate, if you will, the merits of any particular topic. So again, the, the confidence to do that comes from you've studied. Makes sense. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you, Smooch. Um, and I think we've got time for one more question. Um, this is a okay. big question. So, you know, um, you know, you could sort of approach it in different ways, but um, it's something that we get asked a lot at our events by people uh, in the audience, which is what do you think the IRL will be like in three to five years time? And, uh, you know, what skills will be most important in the future? Um, so a big, big question, as I was saying, but, you know, any any thoughts you have on that area would be fantastic. What you're really asking me for is get my crystal ball out, which is one of my favorite kind of lanes to be in. I think the future of IR is going to evolve into including a chapter. So five, seven, 10 years of experience in global management consulting firms as a global consultant where you are tasked with everything from strategy development, helping companies regroup, helping companies pivot. Um, I think that's going to be a chapter of experience that companies are going to want. And I also feel that having experience as an economist is going to become really important. I mean, in just in the last seven to eight years, we, we even a decade, we've seen how the global capital markets are wholly interlocked. Whereas prior to that, you could know your own home economy, whether it was you know, Europe or the US or Asia, and, and you could be a great IRO. It has wholly changed. So I think the more people can immerse themselves in understanding the global economy and the triggers and how they affect the company that they work for today will give in interviews them and offer the management team interviewing them the confidence to extrapolate that they will be able to do it for their company. Um, and I think if you have a chance to go to work in your early years of your career for a management consulting firm, do it. I think they that management consulting firms provide the very best grounding and training um, that you could ask for no matter what job you go into. In fact, I'll give you an example. I'm working with a technology company right now where the CEO is a completely off-spec CEO for this particular company. No experience in the technology industry, but he has 20 years experience in a global consulting firm transcending uh, or traversing, I should say, a wide variety of industries. And he's the perfect individual to give a clean perspective on a topic that he's just getting to know. And that makes a difference. So that would be my crystal ball for the next five to 10 years. Fantastic. No, that, that's really interesting. Some thoughts there, yeah, on where the industry is going and yeah, what kind of skills companies may be looking for in the future. Um, Thank you, Smooch. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the time we have for this video. Um, thank you so much, Smooch, for joining us and fielding all of those questions on all those different topics. You're welcome. I'll look forward to uh, the next one. Um, as always, you know, we'd love to include any questions you, the audience, have um, for future videos. And so if you have any career questions or, or dilemmas that you're turning over in your mind, um, that you're pondering, then please do get in touch with us. Email them to us in the email that's below this uh, video in the description. We'll include those in one of our future videos. Um, but for now, thanks so much for watching and see you again soon.